and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. This is the podcast conversation about accelerating the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society. And I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. Thanks for joining the conversation today. Our fashion choices have tremendous impact on the environment. The rise of fast fashion resulted in a tidal wave of clothing in the world's landfills. But even traditional fashion choices can increase your personal environmental footprint if not selected using sustainable criteria, cared for and washed correctly, and worn until they can be recycled. Our guest today is Aaron Houston, who co-founded Wearwell, a woman-owned company that helps its customers choose sustainable clothing, accessories, and shoes, as well as resell used items they no longer want to wear. The Wear Well catalog is carefully designed by Erin and her team to feature responsibly manufactured fashion, clothing from certified B corporations that mix profit with social impact, as well as from women and Black-owned fashion lines for women of all sizes. The company also offers a re-commerce option called Wear Well Again that delivers customers free shipping of pre-loved clothing, shoes, and accessories, as well as awards for between 5% and 15% off their next purchase. Clothing for the rising middle class around the world, which has tripled in size since 2000, according to Credit Suisse, is one of the fastest growing sources of plastic pollution and waste headed for landfills. The World Bank estimates that 70% of China's population could achieve middle-class status by 2030, and the rise of India's economy will also contribute to more demand for fashionable clothing. The question we need to ask is whether humanity can find satisfaction in making the clothing we buy last longer. Much of the problem is due to the focus on shopping rather than wearing and caring for clothing. Perhaps the change we need to make is to place the emphasis not on how many clothing pieces we acquire, but rather making them last. Re-commerce, selling used items that can be worn by others, is a potential source of satisfaction for the shopper craving change. Wear well again, in similar services, could enable the constant exchange of clothing to satisfy the need for novelty we all feel, but limiting shipping and other re-commerce related environmental impacts will be a challenge until we achieve a carbon neutral transportation infrastructure. There are many changes to make and myriad opportunities for new businesses. Let's look into the Wear Well closet and see what we can find. You can learn more about Wear Well at shopwearwell.com. Shop Wear Well is all one word, no space, no dash. Let's get into the conversation. Welcome to the show, Erin. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Mitch. Well, thank you for joining us. Now, you know, you and your co-founder, Emily Kenny, worked for more than 10 years in international development in countries like Cambodia and India and elsewhere, doing supply chain measurement and impact assessments for Fortune 500 companies. How did what you learned there lead you to launch Wearwell, a, a curated women's sustainable clothing retailer? Yeah, Emily and I, we met in grad school at American University in the School of International Service. And and it was an interesting coming together of our backgrounds because she was the one who was living and working in the field in those countries that you mentioned, doing that impact measurement, and then you know, entered into grad school uh, and was really working on how do we how do we measure impact in a way that is meaningful? It's a it's a big issue in global development. Um, meanwhile, I was working with those Fortune 500s that you mentioned, helping them communicate about the impact that they were making through their supply chains in developing communities. And so we were seeing we were seeing global impact from two very different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And of course, when you're in school and you're in the classroom, you start having these conversations, not just about you know, the projects that you're working on, but how is this applying across your daily life uh, and the way that you choose to live your life each moment? And we both realized we had spent each about a decade in this profession. We were focusing our, our graduate degrees on it. Uh, we were experts when it came to impact uh, for all intents and purposes. But when it came to our daily purchases, we were shopping locally and sustainably for our food. We had figured out how to make other sustainable swaps in our lives. But our clothing and accessories, we both didn't know how to shop sustainably. And so you have to rewind. This was uh, about seven years ago now. And it was really a big challenge to figure out where you could find things that were sustainably and ethically made that fit your style preferences and your needs and also fit your budget. And it was also a moment where companies were starting to pay attention to sustainability a bit more, but really just early days. And a lot of it was greenwashing. So we really wanted to figure out a way to cut through the noise for ourselves personally. And that's how we we got into this space. Uh, we were not fashionistas. <laughs> we, we really got into it from the impact angle. 
So what were the early challenges and how did you develop the criteria for mm-hmm. curating what you sell on Shopware Well? Yeah, so we um, early on, a lot of the challenge was uh, was really figuring out how do we do this in a way where we communicate, first of all, that it's not possible to build a fully sustainable supply chain in clothing and accessories today. Uh, and that is you know, a really unique moment where you take a look at the industry and you take a look at everything that's going on and you say, okay, we believe that it can be better but it's not possible. We would have to stop wearing clothing and stop consuming for the clothing industry to be truly sustainable. And so we said, okay, how do we take a look at this and measure uh, the ways that we can essentially minimize harm as much as possible in Mm -hmm. supply chain, whether that is uh, through the lens of workers' rights or through the lens of environmental sustainability. And for us, the word sustainable of course, had an environmental piece to it, but it also very much carried workers' rights in that that criteria for us. And I always like to highlight that because I think that can often get lost, especially when we're talking about clothing, but it's really, really important. And I'll explain why it's important in the, the environmental sense as well and how those tie together. Really, when you're talking about garment workers, there are over 80 million garment workers around the world, 85% of whom are women. So it's definitely a global women's issue. But we know that climate change disproportionately affects female populations and women. And we also know that it disproportionately affects people who live in developing communities. So when we took a look at what does it mean to really build a sustainable industry, we said, okay, this needs to also encompass workers' rights uh, within that definition. Um, You also asked about our our approach and, and that criteria. And so we really looked at how can we develop a system where we're thinking about those two facets, but also thinking about how can a company make progress without Mm -hmm. being held to a perfect standard, Uh, because progress is really important when it comes to finding solutions for the environment. Um, And so we developed a criteria where you could source in a myriad of different ways, all of which we felt through our research that was done in grad school, that it could make a meaningful difference in the supply chain and in in the impact for the industry. Um, And likewise for workers' rights, but we have a more specific criteria around wages and worker safety there. Now, a lot of of shoppers struggle with balancing their values. Yep. Do you find that there are clothes that excel in one category, like being plastic free, but that require you make trade-offs with other values, for instance, a preference for women-owned brands or labor rights? I love that question because it's something we get into all the time. We really feel that our job is to help guide someone towards expressing their values through their purchases. Our job is not to name and shame certain brands or say you should absolutely be shopping this way. And I think the the easiest trade-off to look at there is around vegan shopping. Uh, Some people want to shop vegan because they believe very strongly in animal rights Mm -hmm. uh, or they want to shop vegan for the environmental aspect. Uh, But when you look at most vegan leathers today and the leather alternatives, what you'll see is that there's often a plastic coating. And so when you're thinking about animal rights and animal protection, plastic is not good for the ecosystems in which animals live. And so you really have to think about which trade-off matters most to you. And are you going to shop uh, plastic-free and vegan? Or are you going to think about, I want to be supporting a brand that stands for animal protection And maybe uses something like apple leather, which minimizes the amount of plastic that is going into the environment. Um, And maybe that brand is also working on circularity down the road. And so we look at those brand priorities and we just help guide individuals through brand narratives, but also through um, impact icons and badges that really give someone an idea of the type of of impact they're supporting with their purchase and helps them navigate that trade-off. Those, those badges are, are how you express the values-based choices to the shopper. Uh, exactly. They are not directly comparable in the sense I can't pick two items and, and, and get an assessment. Have you thought about how to help somebody make that judgment for themselves? Yes. So we do that through a variety of different ways. One, there is a essentially a shop by values section on our site where you can start with the one that matters most to you. So uh, for example, if I care most about women's rights, I'm going to shop women-owned brands. And then I'm going to take a look into that and I'm going to see, okay, every brand where well sources from pays a fair and living wage. Great. But I also want to be supporting a brand that 
hires women in their in their garment work or in their artisan shops. Um, and I'm going to dig into those details from there. So we really give someone a starting point to be able to navigate that. And then we also educate through our, our blog. Um, our blog is called The Source by Wearwell, and we go deep into the issues um, and help people identify, okay, if I have these different values, how do I figure out which one truly means the most to me and the impact that I want to make um, and really helps them form an opinion. That's a really important piece of sustainable shopping. Now, you, you offer a membership program, yeah. Wearwell membership, and, and, and the benefits include a styling service, which I assume can be engaged with one's values. Yes. How does, how does it work? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of history as to why we started a membership. I think it surprises a lot of people. But if you go back to what I mentioned early on, you know, we really started Wearwell because we had this issue of not being able to find clothing that was sustainably made that fit our personal style, that fit the impact that we wanted, and that fit our price point. And so our membership is really centered around providing access to a sustainably and ethically made clothing and accessories and home goods and secondhand that is 10% off for members every time they make a purchase. They also get a lot of other perks that we can go into later. But really, another main piece there is that personal styling. And what that is, is it's a real human. It's not AI. It's a real human who's reading profile information that you give us. You tell us all about your personal style. You tell us about your impact preferences, as well as your lifestyle. You know, do you live in the Pacific Northwest and hike often? Are you running after two kids in a city? You know, is it really uh, is that something that's impacting the choices that you're making and then the stylist helps pick things that are practical for you that will stay in your wardrobe for a while and then can also highlight things that fit that value set that you have so for example if you're vegan they will make sure that they are choosing only vegan items to be able to show you in your personalized selection and it's all delivered digitally so really low carbon footprint we are not shipping product to someone uh, unless they intend to purchase and keep it uh, for a try on period you know instead they are they are purchasing it uh, from that styling session online to again minimize that that back and forth that's an important point the idea mm -hmm. that they're really only going to get it when they intend to keep it do you find that curated wardrobes are less likely to be returned than the average e-commerce site which i mean their returns are between 18 and 30 percent Yes, yes. Our returns are consistently lower than the industry average. And I think it's it's for a couple of reasons. One, I, I believe that if it's a curated shopping experience, someone is going to be a lot happier with what they're getting. And they're naturally going to be more intentional about what they're purchasing and see it be a part of their wardrobe for a long time. But I also think when someone receives a piece that's ethically made, especially if they're newer to shopping sustainably, they're going to realize the construction is very, very different from what you'll find in fast fashion or just everyday stores that most people are used to shopping at. And it's going to last a lot longer. You can see it and you can feel it when you touch the items that they're high quality and they're going to last a while. And so I think that also leads to lower returns. Someone can see themselves wearing it for a while because they have gone through that process with a stylist and they can see that it's going to last them for several years, if not longer than that. So how do you manage and, and minimize both the cost and environmental impacts of your free shipping and the returns program? Is the packaging compostable, for instance, and do you use slow shipping versus air freight? Yeah, exactly that. So, you know, I think the reality is in today's world, this the online shopping allows us to reach more people. So this goes back to those trade-offs that you mentioned, right? But we do get intentional about how we ship. We ship uh, the slowest available through USPS, so through a shipping service that is all already going door to door with different items. And then all of our packaging is compostable, uh, unless it is a box, which is 100% post consumer recycled and recyclable. This is a really interesting conversation. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. And we are back to continue our discussion with Aaron Houston, co-founder at Wearwell, which is a sustainable women's clothing retailer. Uh, Aaron, the Wear Well Again program offers very generous discounts for people who send in used clothing. How does the program work and, and what kinds of, of uh, rebates do you get? Yeah, so on the consumer side, the way that it works is if you've made a purchase through Wearwell or with one of our brand partners and you have their products in your closet, you're going through a closet clean out and you decide, you know what, this is ready to, to move into someone else's wardrobe. Instead of donating it to a place that's local to you or maybe you don't know where it ends up, which is a reality of clothing donations, 
or, you know, instead of, of finding some other way of getting rid of it, unfortunately, disposing it is what a lot of people do. We say, don't do that. Request a label, send mm -hmm. it to us. If we can resell it, we will. And if we can't, we will donate it responsibly to a trusted nonprofit that is local to our headquarters. Um, and the way that that works for the customer is they then get up to 20% off a future purchase simply for sending us product. Um, and we we pay for that shipping label for them. Um, and so the incentive is really to replace the items that they are getting rid of and that are too worn out for their own taste, for example, get them into someone else's wardrobe and give them an opportunity to replace those items with sustainably made items. And so we like to talk about our secondhand program as secondhand that was sustainably made in the first place because it's not fast fashion, something that's going to fall apart after it's resold to you after one or two wears. Um, and then, you know, on the business side, I think this is a really important point to highlight for anyone who is running a retail business or a clothing company. That incentive for us to resell product is not just for our environmental impact and for the, the company's mission. There is a real business behind it for us. If we're giving the customer a discount for a future purchase, it incentivizes them to come back and shop with us. But we've also only paid for that secondhand quote unquote inventory, if you will, by paying for a shipping label. So sure. for us, it, it creates a new revenue stream for us that is legitimate. Now, do you have a sense of how that generous recycling credit, keep, how much it reduces the cost of winning the next sale from the customer or for a new customer, uh, making them aware of the fact that they have a recycling option, does that attract new customers? We find that it does. And I think a lot of that is because of this discussion that's starting to happen around how sustainable is secondhand. You were seeing that secondhand, yes, has a wonderful opportunity for consumers to uh, be more circular with their own behaviors and reduce their overall consumption. But if we treat secondhand as this is just a faster way to move through product in my wardrobe, it's not that sustainable. So we're starting to be able to have those conversations of this is a way to, to, to do that uh, in, in, a, in a method that creates an opportunity for someone to put sustainable clothing in their closet in the first place without paying full original price for it. Well, and there are a lot of reuse programs out there that encourage exactly. you to wear something once or twice and then send it back. So exactly. what you're doing is really kind of preaching, make progress, don't be perfect. You, you don't have to never buy any or, or wear other clothes again, but don't go fast fashion half the time. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. What percentage of your sales are pre-loved items at this point? So it's relatively small in comparison to the business that we do, but... It, that is because a lot of our clothing lasts a very long time. So we have a lead time of a couple of years to get those items back to us. So it's an interesting predicament where it it really, you know, it accounts for probably somewhere between five and 10% of our revenue uh, annually at this point. But, you know, I'll, I'll uh, make a mention just yesterday, we opened a Wear Well Again return package from a customer and it had two items from the year that we started the company that are in great condition that we can resell. So to us, that's okay if it's a smaller amount, simply because there's not a ton of supply coming back to us because it's lasting a while. Do you see that customers are looking for reused items and recycling options? In other words, they're pre-cycling before yeah. they make a purchase? We we do. They um, our our second hand is the fastest sell through of anything else on our website. So it's definitely something that people are looking for um, and people are interested in. Now, going back to the membership program, is part of the curation and styling service keeping track of what somebody might already own and 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 encouraging them to re return it? Great question. So it is part of part of that is keeping track of what have they already purchased through us? What have they told us they already have so that we're not duplicating things in their wardrobe mm -hmm. or duplicating things that they might have seen already. Uh, but we're not necessarily encouraging directly through the styling session that they send things back in. Uh, we're just making that available to our entire audience because you don't have to have a membership to shop with us. So we really encourage it through a variety of different ways. Uh, retail is a service mm -hmm. involving a product. And, and we know that the service economy is growing. As you think about the role that Wearwell will have in women's fashion lives, do you imagine being their full service and almost sole source of styling? We hope so. You know, I think when it comes to 
styling Yes, it's great, but not everyone needs a stylist. So when we think about the role that we can play for people, we think, how do we build the company that's the one-stop shop for someone who wants to build a sustainable wardrobe? And styling might be the answer for some people, or it might be helpful at the start for some people. But really, we want to be that source where someone knows they want to be able to shop sustainably, and they can come to our site and know that we've vetted every single brand that we work with. We work with over 50 brands today, and we're constantly onboarding new ones. And so that's really the direction that we see ourselves going in uh, is less a styling service, more a place where someone can come and know that they can feel confident about the purchases they're making and know that we as leaders of the brand are constantly working on improving the way that we source and the way that we do things. Well, in terms of the styling, I mean, thinking about personal profiling and, and yeah. knowing the items that somebody has, you could say these things go together or we have something that will complement what you have. Do you see customers starting to share that level of information or express more desire for, for solutions that you can step into with by collecting and using that data effectively? Yes, absolutely. And I'd say the main use of that is really around capsule wardrobes. There are a lot of consumers who are saying, I want to I want to minimize the amount that I'm consuming and I want it to be easier to get dressed in the morning. I want to have to make fewer decisions. And so our stylists and our resources can help someone build a capsule wardrobe. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's really uh, having having fewer items. Some people will look at a capsule wardrobe as a very strict, like I've got three pairs of pants, I've got two skirts, I have two dresses and five tops and that's it. And they all go with one another. It doesn't have to be that strict, um, but that is one way that we help people really navigate what goes with other things and how can they minimize what they're buying overall and make sure that they're buying things that they're going to wear for a long time. And that's through taking that capsule wardrobe approach. And we hear that through the feedback with stylists. We hear that through inquiries all the time to our website. Um, it's our most popular blog post, how to, how to successfully build a capsule wardrobe. Um, so you definitely see an appetite for that. Now, you you, pr you provide an impact report, but it doesn't offer any quantitative data about the environmental impact of the clothing that you sell. I, and I understand, of course, you're a small company. Each of the brands that you're working with is a small company. How do you how do you plan to assess the total environmental impact of your uh, the wardrobes that you sell in the future? Is is this a problem of the, your brands providing you scope one and two uh, emissions data and other environmental impacts before you can roll up all that data to say, here's what Wearwell's impact is? Yeah, it's a great question. And I love the way that you asked that because it is really, really challenging. Uh, yes, we are small. Yes, our brands are small. And it does place a big burden to ask them to report in a certain way. It places a burden on their ability to do their work well. Uh, and so I think there's that issue of rolling, rolling data up that we took a hard look at it early on. And we said, if we try to build these buckets of data that we first of all place a burden on the brand and require them to report that way, but second of all, we we say, okay, this is what we care about most. This is what we care about reporting most. It does a couple of things. And the most problematic of which is it skews the reporting in a way that is misrepresentative of the impact that we're making. And so that's something that we never want to do to our customers. We never want to say, hey, your purchases led to X amount of carbon reduction when we can't actually validate that because we aren't the ones measuring it. Uh, and that is something that we know that there's going to be an opportunity down the road as our brand partners grow and they do have more capacity and we have more capacity. So when we think about the future, we think about how do we get those brands to report specifically with criteria of impact that they currently make and find a way to weave those together in a picture that is accurate and doesn't misrepresent data. I, I think that's a very fair answer. But of course, every company needs to accept the responsibility of assessing its burden on the planet. And uh -huh. and I'm I'm wondering if you're looking at Amazon's announcement that they're going to require all vendors to disclose their environmental impacts by 2025 as sort of the break point where that kind of emissions and other environmental transparency is going to become just the de facto practice. I hope it does. I really hope it does. I think there's flaws in what Amazon is doing and the direction that they're headed in simply because we can... Is it, is it progress? But it's not progress. Fair. Exactly. Exactly. So I think, you know, one of the one of the the flaws that 
I would encourage everyone to start correcting is the use of carbon offsets to talk about reducing their environmental impact. It doesn't actually reduce the environmental impact in the production. And all of your listeners know that, right? But we need to be having a more widespread conversation about that, especially when it comes to supply chain reporting and transparency. But I think you're spot on that it's progress. It's going to become the norm to report on it. Where we take things is not just reporting on it and making it transparent, but making it truly impactful. Uh, and when it comes to the environmental impact, reducing the impact and making sure we're holding people to benchmarks and standards. It, it truly impactful also in, implies that we have a narrative that explains that and makes it palpable to the to the shopper. How do you envision telling the story of the reduced the reduced impact of fashion in people's lives is that a, a part of your marketing strategy going forward yeah yeah i think we do that in a few different ways currently but really it, it comes down to to sharing with someone you've made an impact in the ways that you want to make an impact so going back to that vegan example that i shared early on we can we can share with someone you've purchased x amount of vegan items through us or if it's someone who cares about shopping organic, you shopped X amount of organic tops and dresses through us and finding a way to, to create that narrative and that link of the impact that they're making. But I think there's really an opportunity that we can do better that I'm really excited about for our future of being able to look at literally the dollar amount that someone has spent, how much of that has gone back to the brand and how much of that has gone to the workers. And that is data that is a lot easier to track and trace. Really? Yes, because it's it's clearer than something like a, comparing a brand that uses dead stock material versus a brand that uses organic material, right? Well, you're counting dollars. Exactly. We're counting dollars. We're not, you know, comparing apples to oranges when it comes to materials use or ways of reducing environmental impact. I can imagine getting a year-end sort of impact report that also says next year you could do better in the following ways because yes. these are the things you like. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So there's a way to to start incentivizing coming back and shopping in ways that are even more aligned with someone's desired impact. Well, and I think that's key to the, the consumer transition that we need to make in terms of the behavior that we all contribute to the impact on the world. Do you get a lot of ideas from the community? Or how do the customers contribute to shaping the collection? We've always treated our, our customers as a community, and it's something where when someone joins our email list early on, we ask them, what are they looking for? We've got thousands and thousands of people on our email list, so that's a lot to be able to, to gather and, and ask about and say, like, what are you looking for? Are you looking for that, that capsule wardrobe? Are you looking for some unique pieces that you maybe can't find elsewhere uh, and really help tailor that experience to them? I think the other unique asset that we have is the brand partners that we work with we don't source everything that they carry. Instead, we curate from them. And that's something that has always resonated with our customers. And so we'll not just take into account, what do they tell us? Uh, how are they engaging with us? But we'll take into account, what are the things that they're telling their stylist? Uh, what are yeah. the ways that they're choosing to live their lives? A really fun example I love to, to talk about is we had a customer and a stylist realize that they had they were both going to Greece within the same month of one another. And it was through their notes and the feedback that they were giving one another that they started swapping travel tips and they started talking about ecotourism in that discussion. And so it, there's a really interesting way for us to get to know what our customers need, not just from a style and price point place, but from a place of, okay, we know our customers love to travel, but how can they do it more sustainably? How can we set them up for success uh, when it comes to the ways that they choose to live their lives? How are you going to grow the company? Do you anticipate moving into new categories like sportswear or clothing for children or even men? Yeah, we hope we can start to serve men at some point. There aren't enough brands on the market to be able to offer what we offer now in a in a meaningful way for men's, but it's definitely in our why, future. Why is that? I, I have to ask. Why yeah, I think there's a few reasons. I think one, men's style does not does not change at the rate that women's does. And so there's just not as much competition in, in the men's sphere. We also know women spend more on clothing. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem that I wish I understood more deeply in that space. And I wish that there is a solution to, but uh, we have started a gender neutral collection that is our first kind of foray into that mm -hmm. and a stepping stone for us to get to offering men's. Uh, but there's a lot more work to be 
be done when it comes to expanding our services. You know, one of the the conversations that's really happening right now that uh, we're loving being a part of is the the extended sizing needs uh, within the space. So not a lot of sustainable fashion comes in anything other than extra large. Uh, more than fifty percent of the population needs extended sizing, whether that's plus sizes or petites. And so that's a mm -hmm. huge part of the community that's missing from the sustainable fashion offering. And so for us, because we don't manufacture, we're looking to source more from brands that do offer that plus sizing, that petite sizing. And that's really the next expansion for us because there's a ton of people who need it. Now, earlier, you mentioned that you look for brands that are working towards circularity. What does that look like? I mean, and when you think about where whales role in one of your customers' lives in the future, what will it be like, say, in 10 years uh, mm. in terms of your facilitation, not simply of what they're wearing, but how that material is ultimately stewarded? Yes. Uh, so when we think about where we can take the industry and what our role is there, we think about circularity as something that you've got to make progress on. It's great to be able to dream up a supply chain where the piece of fiber that you started with goes back to the earth and creates a new fiber that you can recreate a product with. But that's not the reality today. I would love if it were, but it's simply not. And so really working with brands that are innovating around how they look at the end of life of clothing is the most important piece for us. So that is, for example, it can be anything from a brand that has cracked the code on their materials and they can fully recycle them or they are fully biodegradable. Another way to look at end of life, there's a variety of of methods there. So we're really sure. looking at how do we play that role for consumers with looking at uh, making sure that they have an opportunity to see how they can close out the life of that item, whether that's by sending it back to us through a program like Wear Well Again and us reselling it to someone, or it's sending it back to us to responsibly donate or responsibly dispose of. And when I say responsibly dispose of, I'm really talking about fabric recycling that nonprofits mm -hmm. like Fab Scrap are doing an amazing job of navigating and innovating in, or through things like composting and biodegrading in the right way, because a lot of consumers still don't know how to do that. And so it's starting to provide those services to them so that the consumer doesn't have the burden of figuring all of that out on their own. You're describing an environment in which the retailer becomes the, the servant curator on behalf of the customer. Um, exactly. Is, how does that change the financial model? Is more of your business around the service than the material you sell? That is a great question. I think, you know, for us, when we look at how we make money and what our business model is, it really comes down to how we started the company. When we started, we said, yes, we have this personal problem that we want to solve, but we also knew enough about the industry and about the sustainable fashion space that we said, okay, the issue here is very different from the rest of the fashion industry. These brands have trouble reaching their consumers. Yeah. These brands don't need to be competing with one another. They need, they need to be working together. And so we built a platform that is really working for the support and growth of our brand partners, not to push down their margins, not to compete with them directly. And so instead, we think about if we can build all of these additional services, we'll sell more product in a way that lifts up those brands. So our revenue will always be through product, uh, but there are pieces of that revenue and that business model where it just simply makes sense for us to continue pushing our impact because it drives loyalty with our customers, but it also drives a deeper partnership with brands that are really walking the talk. And that's a core value for us that we know is gonna get us further as a business. Erin, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to thank, thank you, you for spending time with us today. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. We've been speaking with Erin Houston, co-founder of Wearwell. And you can shop the site at shopwearwell.com. Shop Wearwell is all one word, no space, no dash, shopwearwell.com. There's a lot to learn from that conversation. So allow me to rattle off a few of the key ideas. Progress, not perfection, has to be our goal. When we give stern lectures about what people should or should not do, they turn away. But when we offer clear information that enables values-based decisions, people can make changes in their behavior and purchases that produce a real environmental and social benefit. Aaron mentioned that reducing harm is a key criteria in Wearwell's selection of fashion brand partners. 
Now we can reduce the burden on the largely female workforce in the fashion industry by choosing brands that apply fair trade and responsible labor practices. But the real transition in fashion will come when the industry is able not just to promise less harm, but also offer regenerative solutions to making clothing, not just improving the lives of the, the female workforce, but restoring nature is our ultimate goal. And all of that can come together when we all make decisions with a, a, a solid insight into what our impact will be. So curation and stewardship are the new business values. We live in an incredibly complex world and our, our economy is Byzantine. It's easy to make bad decisions in this environment. Even, even though there's so much information, a lot of it is simply not useful and much of it is misleading. The new wave of retailers will not focus on mass marketing, but emphasize personal service and informed shopping. As we heard, curated clothing reduces returns and that lowers environmental impacts of shopping. The value added service Aaron described comes down to building personal relationships that allow each of us to live the way we want according to the values we want and in better harmony with the planet and natural resources we count on in this case for the materials in our clothing. So we're going to keep you posted on what's going on on at Wearwell and across the values-based retailing revolution. Stay tuned. I hope you take a moment to share this podcast or any of the more than 430 interviews that we produced on sustainability in your ear. Folks, if you take a moment to write a review on your favorite podcast platform and, and tell three of your friends to start listening to the show, you can help amplify more ideas so we create less waste. Please tell your friends, family, coworkers that they can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or any other of the podcast purveyors that they prefer. Thanks for your support. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. This is Earth 911, and we will be back with another innovator interview soon. In the meantime, folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. <laughs> <laughs>